Hey, it's Huck. I have now attempted, this is going to be the third time I've attempted to make this video. And every time I get in the middle of this, uh, my phone rings and then it shuts off the recording. And I'm like always like three quarters of the way done. So the first thing I'm going to promise is in this video is that I'm going to try to keep it shorter than the, you know, marathon half hour long videos that I've been making lately. Um, but uh, having said that, uh, there's a lot to cover, a lot of ground to cover. Uh, if there's anything that defines the Trump era that we're living or suffering under right now, it's that the minute you think you have something that's uh, newsworthy to talk about, leave it to Trump and uh, suddenly that's old news. And this is like a daily occurrence. You, I mean, you just can't. It's one of the reasons why I can't seem to get videos out is because the minute I've given some thought to what I want to say, boom, suddenly that's old news or something new to talk about. And of course, I wanted to post something yesterday about the election yeah, because there's a lot to talk about here. Um, but, of course, uh, boom, you know, Trump you know, further obstructs the Mueller investigation by seeing to it that uh, Sessions is let go. And um, so that's a whole other thing. And so I'm going to basically talk about that in a separate video. Uh, I might touch on it a little bit here at the end, but um, basically we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, at another time. What I wanted to concentrate, though, on today was, um, you know, uh, the results of the election. You know, um, why I thought it was a significant, uh, uh, really um, good day for Democrats. And why it doesn't feel that way. Um, you know, I had a little disappointment, uh, personally, um, being from Ohio. I had high hopes that we would... Um, somehow elect, um, you know, a Democrat as governor and, and secretary of state. And this was important for a lot of reasons. One is because I want Ohio to hold on to their expanded Medicare that they got under Kasich. Um, and with a Democrat, I felt, you know, obviously we would expand Medi uh, uh, Medicaid coverage here even further, and we would um, expand the options probably with Obamacare that, um, you know, Kasich was um, – uh, you know, moderate in that sense, as far as the health care is concerned. Um, and Mike DeWine is much less so. Um, and so I really, really didn't want him to win. Unfortunately, you know, we have to face the realization now in Ohio that Ohio has become a red state. And uh, most of the statewide elections ended up in red, um, you know, in, in Republican um uh, hands and uh, here locally, the Mahoning Trumbull County area, northeastern Ohio, where I live, um, it's kind of been a bastion of you know d Democrat strength here in Ohio. Along with um, there's there's basically four four or five parts of Ohio that are largely Democrat. You know, um, Trumbull Mahoning County here, Youngstown Warren area, you know the Cleveland Cuyahoga County area, um, Toledo um, up in the northwestern corner. And then uh, Columbus and uh, uh, kind of the, the Dayton area a little bit. And uh, they've drawn districts in Ohio so that like um, our congressman's um, 17th district here that encompasses a little bit of Mahoney County, a little bit of Youngstown, most of Trumbull County. And um, uh, it steers its way all the way into um, – the the strong Democratic pockets of, uh, like, Akron in the center of the state. Um, that's the 17th district. Um, another district is uh, takes in most of Cleveland, and uh, another district is down in Franklin County, um, taking in a good portion of um, the most Democratic portions of Columbus. And uh, each of those districts are, like, 70 to 80 percent Democrat. They've packed in as many Democrats as they possibly could to leave fewer Democrats everywhere else. And so the rest of the districts, um, there's like four Democratic districts in Ohio out of 15. And um, those four Democratic districts are like close to 80% Democrat. And the Republican districts are like 60%, 65% Republican. Um, you know, it's weird because like Ohio votes, like even now I call it a red state, but it's about 52% red. And yet uh, we're 11-4, um, you know, or 10-5, you know, every election as far as uh, congressional districts because of the way the districts are drawn. And our state legislature is just as bad. 
So I was disappointed in, I was kind of hoping that Cordray would win. I had mentioned in my last video that uh, one of the things I kind of looked at, um, you know, as a bellwether uh, was one, you know, would a Democrat have a chance to win? Uh, well, one was clearly um, one of the things I looked at was, you know, what Trump's strength was in that area. And Trump did well here in northeastern Ohio, uh, unfortunately, which is, you know, highly Democratic. Um, he did well in portions of Pennsylvania um, and um, working class sections of Michigan and, and uh, Wisconsin. So it was really disappointing to see Ohio go red. Um, I had kind of hoped Cordray might be able to overcome, you know. There were two things I was looking at prior to the election. You know, the way the polls were trending, and the polls seemed to be trending in favor of Cordray. In fact, the last couple of polls showed him ahead. That looked good. But the other thing I looked at also was, you know, what is Trump's strength? And unfortunately, Trump's strength is actually higher in Ohio than it was in Michigan or Pennsylvania or Wisconsin. And he won the state by a bigger margin than in, in any of those states. Um, and, and unfortunately, I think this election proved that that's not changed. Um, so that's, that's really disappointing. The other disappointing thing, and I'm just trying to get the disappointing things out of the way, um, the the other disappointing thing was I think there was so much attention nationwide. If you watch any of the political coverage leading up to the election, a great deal of attention was was devoted to uh, Beto O'Rourke, you know, in his race in Texas against um, Ted Cruz. Uh, the two races in Florida, where uh, Governor Rick Scott was going up against the. Uh, um, uh, uh, Senator uh, Bill Nelson trying to defend his uh, Senate seat and uh, where Tallahassee uh, Mayor uh, Gilliam was uh, attempting to run uh, for governor against uh, a real Trump um, right wing guy DeSantis. And um, and of course, there was the um, Stacey Abrams governor's race in Georgia against, um, you know, this uh, Brian Kemp, who had um, received a lot of publicity because of the voter suppression tactics um, he'd been using uh, for some time down there. Um, and so it was kind of disappointing that with so much attention on those races, and then as it turned out, all of those races kind of you know, narrowly, but but um, fell into Republican hands. Now, I know Stacey Abrams is fighting um, for every last vote there, and she hasn't conceded that race. Um, she's basically hoping, I think uh, the margin at last I saw was about 62,000 votes separating the two. And um, the number of outstanding votes, provisional ballots or whatever, um, it's unlikely she's going to, you know, overtake a 62,000 margin. And I don't think that's even what she's trying to accomplish here. Um, she's got a team of lawyers down there fighting to the nail to get these votes counted, including some provisional ballots for people that showed up and were told that they were no longer registered. It's um, It's been reported that Brian Kemp has purged 1.4 million voters from the voting rolls since 2014. If that's even close to true, um, well, I don't know. Uh, there's, there ought to be a law. At any rate, uh, God bless her. I think what she's trying to accomplish, though, is to cut into this 30,000 vote threshold that puts him up over 50%. If he falls, if the margin that he's winning falls below 50%, I think he's got like 50.3 or 54, 50.4% of the vote. And I think she's at like 48.7% or something like that. And under Georgia law, if you fall, if the winner has less than 50% of the vote, they have to have a two-person runoff. The top two people would have a... And so they would take these other, I think there's like two other marginal candidates that are on the ballot that I think between the two of them probably account for maybe one, one and a half percent of the vote, if that. 
Uh, at any rate, under Georgia law, they would have to have a two-person runoff and uh, giving her, you know, at least another legitimate shot at uh, uh, try, trying to win that election. And I think that's what she's trying to do. She's trying to get enough votes counted that uh, I don't know if there's enough votes out there that can um, cut that 30,000 vote uh, margin that uh, has put him over 50 percent. But, uh, you know, I wish her the best. Um, same thing with uh, Senator Nelson down in Florida is um, – uh, called for a recount in there. I think he may be entitled to that because of the closeness of the vote. I'm not sure. Um, but um, again, I think it's going to be a, uh, again, because of the voter um, suppression tactics and the fact that, the, you know, people are waiting like in Florida, in parts of Florida, it's uh, notorious. Um, the number of um, people that have to wait, you know, hours in line to vote. And some people just don't have that much time. You know, they got to be back at work or whatever, and they can't miss it miss the time or whatever. It's um, at any rate, it's going to be an uphill climb for him. Um, you know, it's it's states like Florida and Georgia. I mean, I guess they found something like 600 voting machines in Georgia that weren't used. Um, perfectly functioning machines that just weren't used, you know, in and around Atlanta and some other places where voting, you know, required, you know, in some cases, three, four hours of people waiting around. Um, to vote. Uh, so, like I say, there's some really nasty um, techniques that are used uh, in states. Uh, you know, Ohio has had um, its own voter suppression um, um, things by this uh, Houston, who is the Secretary of State under Kasich, and now uh, Houston is going to be our Lieutenant Governor under uh, Mike DeWine. DeWine. Anyway, so those are all the disappointing things. And the trouble with all of that is that with so much attention, you know, before the election addressed to those particular races, that as we were watching on election night, and, and like I said, the Democrats didn't win those races or apparently haven't won any of those races. Despite what success the Democrats did have, you couldn't help but feel somewhat disappointed and let down. And the truth is, I think that was the wrong attitude. Um, I, I think, you know, we, I don't think we've uh, fully grasped just how significant the Democratic gains were. Um, keep in mind, you know, the economy is moving along pretty swimmingly right now as, you know, as it is. Um, I mean, there are problems. People are still working way too hard, working way too many hours. Wages are way too low in some cases. But the unemployment rate, you know, is lower than it's been in a while. And, um, you know, um, spending is up. Um, so is debt. Uh, I can I can relate to that. But typically when the economy is doing as well as it's doing right now, you know, the parties in power usually get, um, you know, the benefit of the doubt. And um, that clearly was not the case. Um, Democrats are going to have taken about when all is said and done, about 35 house seats. Uh, that's at the top end of what I predicted. If you remember the video I made the other day, I said probably between 30 and 35. And it looks like that's what they're going to hit. I think they're at about 30, 31 right now when all is said and done out west and the rest of these districts are kind of like in California and stuff. And we may not know the final results for maybe two weeks. But when it's all said and done, it looks like um, we could have as many as 35 wins. Um, these are formally you know, Democratic seats that have switched to Republican. Um, now, that's a, I think Republicans took two from Democrats, and we've taken like at least 35. Uh, that's a significant change. And to put that in perspective, you know, we talk a lot about the 2010 um, election, the two years after Obama was swept into office and all that Tea Party movement was going out there. And Democrats had this, um, you know, mass annihilation basically in 2010 when Republicans swept, you know, 60 House seats and, uh, you know, grabbed control of the Senate. Uh, and in state legislatures, they won like 15 states, lock, stock and barrel. You know, the entire state legislature, you know, the House representatives in the states, uh, the state Senate and the governorships. They won. They took over control of 15 states. They did that by winning, basically, um, 
by getting about 7% more of the vote than Democrats got in 2010. In other words, Republicans enjoyed about a seven-point advantage in that election. Well, that's identical to what Democrats enjoyed, you know, the other day on Election Day here Tuesday. Uh, Democrats nationwide won by about seven percentage points. We're going to end up with, uh, I don't know, maybe 35 House seats. Uh, We're going to barely hold on to pretty much what we have. We might lose one or two Senate seats, but considering that uh, there were like 19 seats in Republican Trump country districts, the fact that we were able to hold on to the vast majority of them and only lose maybe, I think we lost Heidi Heitkamp uh, in North Dakota, which was kind of a given. Um, we lost, um, uh, it looks like we're going to lose Bill Nelson in Florida. Um, we're, I don't know, there were maybe two or three seats altogether that we're going to lose. But we won, you know, or held on to a lot of the ones that people never thought we would. You know, we, we held on to Tester's seat. We held on to Mansion's seat. We held on to, um, it, well, a lot of seats. Now, while we're talking about the Senate, I guess I should mention one other thing, and that's the, the Ted Cruz better O'Rourke. I know that there are people right now that, um, you know, have kind of um, watched that campaign unfold, and they were really amazed at the success that Beto O'Rourke had not just within the state of Texas, but nationwide, the amount of money he was able to bring into his campaign. Um, And, uh, you know, this is a guy that uh, basically swore off all PAC money, but uh, he was able to get a lot of of money and attract a lot of attention. And uh, a lot of people came away with that, being very impressed with his his campaign. Um, And... um, now, I'll be honest with you. I mean, the guy looks like a legitimate, you know, talented um, politician. And and um, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of people right now that are looking at him as a legitimate 2020 uh, candidate for president. And, um, and I guess I can understand where that's coming from. But I, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is I want to take a little step back there and try to bring some people back to what I think is, uh, you know, uh, down to earth, some reality. The truth is that um, as successful as her work was and as close as he made that election, the fact is he still got beat. And he got beat by probably the most unpopular Republican holding office, at least, you know, in the Senate. Um, And I don't think there's any question that Ted Cruz is just an overwhelmingly um, unpopular person, even within the Republican Party. And um, and so, you know, Beto wasn't able to beat him. And I mean, if there's any Republican, you're going to, you know, if Beto would have made that kind of an impressive um, uh, close run against Greg Abbott, you know, the Texas governor. Or, you know, any number of other, you know, Texas Republican politicians. That'd be one thing. But, you know, he ran a a good campaign, a solid campaign, and, uh, you know, with a very good positive message. And uh, like I say, he's a very energetic guy. Um, Certainly won over a lot of, um, uh, you know, there were, from what I understand, there was a lot of uh, yard signs all over Texas where you never saw them before. Um. You know, just his ability to generate, you know, money uh, was impressive. Um, but I still say that's a far cry from, you know, being a legitimate presidential contender. I can think of a number of people I'd put higher on my list at this point in time, but uh, I guess time will tell. Anyway, that's my two cents on that. Um, the seven point margin that Republicans enjoyed in 2010 swept them into like I say, 60 House seats, 15 statewide, you know, uh, 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 where they controlled, you know, everything in the the state legislature and the governorships. And basically, because of gerrymandering and voter suppression tactics, when Democrats get a seven-point margin, like Republicans enjoyed in 2010, our gains are basically half as much. We got, you know, like I say, 31, maybe 35 House seats. Uh, we barely held on to some of the Senate seats. We had lost, actually, two. Um, we 
Um, we won control of eight uh, uh, state, uh, complete control over eight uh, state legislatures and governorships. I think we switched eight state governorships. Um, but again, that's about half of what uh, Republicans enjoyed uh, in 2010 with the same voter margin. So again, that's, I think, shows you just how, um, you know, how, um, what a hurdle Republicans have put in our path. Um, now, that brings us to the last issue here, and I'm going to let you go before we get too deep into this, because that'll be my next video. And that is that there are a lot of people now that um, are looking at, well, what will Democrats do now that they have some power, at least in the Congress? Um, first of all, one thing is for certain. Uh, we'll see an end to the types of things uh, of governing that we've seen by the Republicans when they had all the reins of power. What Republicans had been doing was they basically were completely ignoring the minority party and going into back rooms and writing legislation. That's how they wrote the tax bill. That's how they attempted to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act, uh, which they were, thank God, unsuccessful in doing. But basically, um, when they didn't need any Democrats for anything, they basically didn't give them the time of day. Uh, now that they're going to require some Democratic um, help to get anything done. Of course, you're going to hear all this talk by Mitch McConnell about uh, bipartisanship. Bipartisanship that was sadly lacking when they didn't, uh, when they didn't need it. Uh, so if I were Democrats, I know you're going to hear a lot of talk right now by a lot of Republicans uh, and by a lot of pundits on both sides that are going to say, that, uh, you know, Democrats, are they going to work with Republicans? Are they going to work and maybe get things done, compromise? Or are they going to be obstructionist? There's that word. When Republicans are obstructionist, it's they're protecting the president. When Democrats are obstructionist, they're obstructionist. You know, I guess I kind of have a word for Republican politics these days, and I call it um, Python politics. And what I mean by that is that they're like a freaking Python. They squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze uh, until they take all of the breath out of you, and they don't let up. And then when they've got you to the point where you basically can't breathe, then they want to be your friend, you know? Because uh, you're, you're powerless to do anything. But once they, you've got a little power and you can fight them, then, uh, you know, suddenly it's like, uh, you know, what are you trying to do? I mean, uh, don't, uh, where's the bipartisanship? Where's the, where's the compromise? You know what? When your policies are that you want to strip, strip women of all rights, when you want to strip gay people of all rights, when you want to strip refugees of all rights, when you want to, you know, deny, you know, that climate change is real and that it's affecting our uh, ability to um, live on this planet, when you want to deny, um, you know, civil rights to black people, to Muslim people, to gay people, it, if your position is to deny all of that, then there is there's no there's no way to compromise with that there there just isn't there's no way to compromise with you with positions that are immoral and unethical you can't compromise with that and so i would ignore all of that and i wouldn't worry a bit i you know one of the one of the exit polls that i paid close attention to after this election was they were asking voters a couple of things and um, two things jumped out at me. One is kind of non-related to this and that was the gun control issue. And um, in a nationwide uh, polling, in exit polling, um, one network reported that, uh, I think it was NBC, reported that 50, I think it was 59% of people said that they were in favor of gun control and something like 34% were not in favor. That's a that's a huge margin. And I believe the margin is probably bigger than that because people have 
different ideas of what gun control means, you know, and I, and I think when you ask that question, uh, some people that uh, actually might favor some gun control might say no, because they're not really sure what you mean by that. You might be wanting them, you know, um, make stronger measures than maybe they're comfortable with. But at any rate, you know, 59 to 34 percent is a pretty big margin, and I think it's a winning margin. And I think more Democrats, even in red states, should um, should boldly campaign, you know, on uh, you know on a gun reform message. And uh, you know whether it's to, to outlaw assault weapons or bump stocks or universal background checks without exceptions. You know, I think there's plenty of room there um, for overwhelming support on that. And I think Democrats have been too scared to run on that for a long time. I don't think the NRA has the power that they used to have anymore on this issue. Uh, so that's one takeaway from the polling, uh, the exit polling. But the other one, more to the point, and the last major point I want to make is that um, I saw something that was a little kind of disturbing to me, but uh, I mean, I guess it kind of makes sense. And, um, and that was that uh, I think it was something like 53 or 54 percent of people said that they were not necessarily in favor of impeaching Trump something like 36 or 38 percent were in favor of meeting Trump. And, you know, my own thinking, and I'm pretty certain that a lot of people that watch my channel are probably in agreement with me, maybe not, but uh, I think a lot of us feel that we have never seen anybody as, uh, as guilty of breaking law and breaking... Um, I mean, there are so many things that disqualify Donald Trump from continuing to hold office. It's you know, I've lost count a long time ago. And so without question, he should be impeached if that was possible. Now, is that possible? Probably not. Should we, you know, should we um, work tooth and nail over the next two years to try to make that happen? I don't know. I do know this. We have to bring to the attention of the American people what he is guilty of. And whether that translates into an impeachment hearing, well, that's another story. But I think one of the reasons why those numbers are skewed the way they are is because Republicans do a pretty good job of, on the one hand, concealing or conniving or uh, obstructing justice from happening, just as they did with, uh, you know, working hand in hand with the Trump you know, White House to try to suppress these House hearings and to, to a lesser extent, the Senate hearings and, and certainly the Mueller investigation itself uh, to try to uh, downplay. This. I mean, where else have you ever seen, uh, you know, a um, incoming administration, presidential administration, two years, you know, in office that had five, count them, five major, you know, um, people involved in their campaign or, you know, holding office that have been indicted and convicted. Uh, without question, Trump should probably be impeached. And without question, the Democrats now taking control of this House Oversight Committee and the House Judiciary Committee and all the rest, they should be conducting legitimate hearings into, you know, and call all of these witnesses back that uh, got the old soft shoe from the Republican chairman, Nunes, and, um, and at least expose what these people are guilty of. And I think those numbers will change, by the way. I think you will get more public sentiment once, you know, it's legitimately shown. Uh, and that's why I say I, I call Republican um, efforts uh, um, Python politics because they, they squeeze and squeeze and squeeze the truth out of everything. Uh, they just, they just, uh, they, they, and then they, and then they look around and act like they're innocent. You know, well, how can you be obstructionist like this? You know, we just want to govern, you know, leave the president alone, quit harassing the poor guy. You know, I'll tell you what. I can't vote for a single Republican for any office, no matter how ethical they may be, simply because I can't any longer abide by anybody that would belong to a party 
that has such low standards, no standards, that that is so obsessed with holding power that they will literally ignore almost any obstruction of justice in order to get their way. Um, you know, I mean, you wouldn't belong to a club if, if most of the members of that club were doing something illegal. And, uh, you know, you wouldn't belong to a church if most of the members of that church were going out, you know, um, doing things that were immoral. Um, and that's why I'm saying I don't know how you can belong to a party um, that has uh, has become what it has become now. Uh, so anyway, those are my thoughts off the cuff here. Uh, again, we we have reached the half hour threshold, so forgive me. Um, I have got a number of other issues that have come up here personally. I'm not going to go into today, but uh, God, I'm waiting for payday because I've got about a week to go here. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, tight. But hey, it, um, my car at least is drivable. So that's, you know, I, I was faced a couple of weeks ago here with a tough decision on my car. My car is 14 years old and things are starting to go wrong. My car was so loud I was starting to get, um, well, I was being stopped. And, you know, and, and then, you know, I just replaced two tires uh, a couple of months ago and now I had to replace the other two. And I... You know, and I finally had to ask myself, do I really want to keep putting money into this car? It's old and, you know, it's rusting. And and uh, the truth is, you know, even these hundreds of dollars that I'm putting into it, um, uh, you know, it's still a lot cheaper than buying an, another used car, which I'd probably have to make payments on, which I'm not even sure I'd be able to continue making payments. Um not only that, my car insurance would go up because I'd have to get, you know, full coverage insurance. I only have liability now. So it was right, no brainer. I don't have that oper I just is no not buying another car is not an option. Yeah, you know, it just wasn't. So uh, so I'm all in on keeping this car running. And unfortunately that required about I just ended up putting about uh well almost $450 into my exhaust system. Most of that I had to put on credit. Um, uh, well, about half of it I put on credit, come to think of it. And um, and, and then I bought $160, I bought tires, and I had to put that on credit. And, um, and I'm not done. There's one or two other things that need to be done in the car, but I'm going to try to hold off until I can save some money. Um, at any rate, like I say, that's life. It's what happens. I've got a couple of teeth here that's got to go. And, um, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. At any rate, that's life. So I will talk to you again later this week when we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what's going on with um, uh, Sessions now uh, out and uh, this new guy uh, in this, uh, as they're describing him, a Trump loyalist who's not too keen on the... Um, on the Mueller investigation uh, and uh, some of the things it's looking at and, uh, and where, uh, you know, where this stands. Uh, so we'll, we'll look at that. I would love to hear your opinion on the election, your, uh, your thoughts on it, you know, anything that comes to mind, how, um, how, you know, how things went in your area, anything significant that, uh, that happened, you know, it may be in your state or your district or whatever, any, um, uh, you know, I know there were a number of states that uh, passed some ballot initiatives or whatever. There's a Florida issue I think that's going to be big that passed uh, uh, allowing a potential 1.4 million, you know, uh, felons are going to be able to get restored voting rights. And that could play a big, a big role in the 2020 presidential election. I know um, I'm not too happy about Ohio and, and uh, Georgia and, um, and Florida you know, falling into Republican uh, governorships and, and uh, state secretary of states and how that's going to play in the uh, 20, um, 2020 election. Um, but this uh, Florida, um, you know, allowing a lot of these folks uh, be able to vote, 
uh, I don't know how many of those 1.4 million people are going to actually, you know, um, register. But uh, it could make a huge difference in, in how Florida votes. And I guess time will tell to see exactly what that does do. Um, but uh, at any rate, it'll be interesting to see how that happens. So anyway, uh, I love reading your comments. I haven't been getting many comments lately. So I, um, you know, I um, strongly um, urge you to, uh, to, to write me a comment. And um, I'll talk to you later. Have a great day.